Britney Fox would be one of the last glam metal groups to really emerge out of the scene before it all came crashing down in the 90s. The band, which hailed from the East Coast music scene, was made up of half of Cinderella's original lineup. And last week I did a video on the band Cinderella. I actually had a number of people in that video ask me to do an episode on Britney Fox. So here we are, and without further ado, let's talk about the band Britney Fox. Britney Fox's origins dated back to the East Coast music scene, more specifically uh, New Jersey and Philly. And it really begins with guitarist Michael Kelly Smith, who was from a suburb of New Jersey uh, called Reading. He would move to Philadelphia just to be closer to the local music scene. One of the first groups he actually played in was a group called Telepath. They would end up losing their second guitar player and went through an auditioning process. And one of those people who showed up would be future Cinderella member Tom Kiefer. While a few members of Telepath actually preferred someone else, Smith was really adamant that Kiefer was the guy and he got the gig. Smith and Kiefer soon became best friends and played in several other cover bands before forming Cinderella. It was prior to them naming themselves Cinderella they had floated the idea of using the moniker Creepshow, but Cinderella won out. Cinderella would actually be one of the first bands on the East Coast scene to do original songs since playing covers was super lucrative at the time. The pair would end up hooking up with drummer Tony Destra and bassist Eric Brittingham. The quartet recorded a demo and had their manager shop it around to different record labels. The problem was that virtually every record label turned them down, claiming that they sounded too much like ACDC and Aerosmith. Smith, however, at one point would nearly audition for Kiss and still had Gene Simmons' phone number. Simmons took a liking to Cinderella and tried to land them a deal with Polygram Records, but Gene wanted to sign them to a deal whereby he would write their songs, and the members of Cinderella would admit that Simmons' songs weren't very good, so things wouldn't work out for the time being. But it would be John Bon Jovi, who was actually in town, working on the band's second record, 7800 Degrees Fahrenheit, and he saw Cinderella perform at the Galaxy Club, a place where the band had a regular residency. John loved the band so much, he notified Derek Shulman of Polygram Records to check them out. Shulman had previously passed on Cinderella after hearing their demo, but at the insistence of John, he went to go check them out, but he still wasn't sold. But he did recognize Kiefer and Brittingham's talent. He would tell the band's manager, a guy named Larry Mazur, that he would sign the band to a development deal, which was worth about $30,000, if they ditched their guitarist and drummer, Michael Kelly Smith and Tony Destra. Kiefer, funny enough, was actually having disagreements with the pair over musical ideas, so they were fired from the band. Cinderella would go on to have a good deal of success with their first album, 1986's Night Songs, which sold over 3 million copies, making it the biggest debut record since Boston's LP 10 years prior. Smith was perplexed by the decision telling VW Music Rocks. At that point with MTV and the image and the songs, it didn't matter if you had a great drummer or an adequate drummer. Same with guitarist Jeff Labar, who was a good player but it just wasn't the same. Despite being fired from the band and Cinderella hiring guitarist Jeff Labar, Labar wouldn't play on all of Cinderella's debut record. Smith had a part in writing some of those early Cinderella songs, and he would add in the same interview that his buddy, a guy named Barry Benedetta, played lead guitar parts on several of the tracks on Night Songs, and to add insult to injury, Smith had to teach Benedetta how to play those parts on the record. Obviously, Smith and Destra were upset with how everything had played out. They spent three and a half years with Kiefer and saw Cinderella take off. Meanwhile, Smith and Destra had to rebuild. Smith would start the band Riding Hood without Destra, just playing with whoever was around at that point in time. It was short-lived though, as the pair soon met a drummer named Dizzy Dean Davidson who played in a band called World War III, and their music was kind of similar to, to Judas Priest. Uh, Davidson soon made the decision that he wanted to quit the drums and become a frontman and guitarist. He already knew the guys in Cinderella and was a big fan, and he attended a lot of their shows at the Galaxy Club and even studied the band. In fact, it was Dean who approached Smith and Destra to form a group since he'd already written several songs, including Long Way to Love and Girl School. Davidson also sounded a bit like Tom Kiefer. They would soon add bassist Billy Childs, who they knew from the Jersey and Philly scene. 
the band would name themselves Britney Fox after an obscure relative of Davidson's from Wales who married into his family in the 17th century. Davidson spotted the name on his family tree one day and thought that he would use it for a band someday down the road. By Davidson's own admission, the band tried to also deliberately go for a British look, recalling, I looked at the old Who, remember the Who when they were in the 60s with the Ruffles? It was like the early Who, Paul Revere and the Raiders, Prince, it was more of a mod look and I ran with it. Since the band members were short on cash in their early days, they had Davidson's sister design their outfits. Britney Fox soon followed in the footsteps of Cinderella packing the Galaxy Club and it seemed like every week they would have two to three new songs written for their set. The quartet would also work day jobs, including painting homes. Davidson would jokingly remark to the Associated Press, I'd be slapping paint on those houses thinking, this is going to be me living here someday. As for watching Cinderella's success, Davidson would recall in the same book how they were painting a house one day and they walked into the kitchen and saw a magazine cover on the coffee table with the band Cinderella on the front cover, adding, he referring to their drummer, lost his sh He was a Sicilian and if they had been anywhere within 10 feet of him, they would have had broken arms and legs. He was like, that was the move that they did. That Cinderella connection helped the band during their early days. They played the Galaxy Club and there was already a buzz building around the band. Britney Fox soon cut a demo in 1986 titled In America and they started shopping it around to record labels. There would be a new label that was interested who was being distributed through CBS Records called Nemper Records who wanted to sign the group. This was February of 1987 and the band had just received the paperwork to sign the label deal and they were ready to start working on their first record when tragedy struck the band. It was on February 8th, 1987 in Somerdale, New Jersey that the band had just finished playing a gig and they were hanging out at the parking lot smoking a joint. Destro would tell the others he was going to split and head to another party. It was a few minutes later the members in the parking lot heard a loud noise and it turns out Destro had gotten into an accident a few blocks away after hitting black ice and slamming into a tree. Billy Childs would recall in the same book, and I quote, and all of a sudden we see a f***ing transmission laying in the road. It was upon arriving at the scene, they'd add that they saw nobody around, no cops, there was no ambulances, nothing, and they went over and saw that Tony was laying behind the car. Childs would go on to say, I remember looking at him and thinking, well, there's not a f***ing mark on him, and I looked around a little bit and then I realized the whole back of his head was gone. The band's deal with Nemper Records soon fell through. The band would ask their friend Adam Furioli to temporarily fill in behind the drum kit. Britney Fox's long-term plan was to get drummer Johnny D to join the group, but he was in a different group called Wasted and they were already signed to Chrysalis Records and they were doing decent but not great. D was a little hesitant to join Britney Fox, insisting that he'd only join if the band got a record deal. I want to point out that the show where Britney Fox got signed actually saw them open for Cinderella. It was a showcase for the label and Tom Kiefer agreed to let Britney Fox open for his band. With a record deal in hand, Johnny D would become the band's new drummer and they got an $80,000 advance for their first record and they pretty much spent the whole amount because back in those days, spending $80,000 to make a record was pretty small budget. Britney Fox would release their self-titled record in June of 1988 and the band would record their first video for the lead single Long Way to Love for MTV. The single would get a good amount of airplay on MTV and peaked at number 100 on the Hot 100 charts. The song would also end up being one of MTV's most requested videos at the time. They would also release a video for the song Girls School which got some airplay on MTV and the video happened to catch the attention of Poison bassist Bobby Dahl. Poison was on tour for their second album and they needed an opening act so they reached out to Britney Fox. But being an opening act for Poison didn't pay a whole lot. In fact, Britney Fox made about $700 a night and they got an additional $5,000 a week from their label. The group's first album would end up going gold, selling half a million copies, and despite being a success, Smith would reveal to VW Music Rocks that the band didn't make any money off the first album because they had to pay them back to make the album, and they spent a lot of money on the music videos. It was following the Poison Tour, Britney Fox hooked up with Joan Jett and Rat and played some more shows. The band also contributed the song Living on the Edge to the Iron Eagle 2 soundtrack. In a lot of interviews that Britney Fox did around the time of their first album, 
The one thing that's brought up again and again is just how positive the band's music was. A dizzy Dean Davidson would remark to the Associated Press, and I quote, All our songs are positive. I have a very positive attitude. I've gone through a lot of bad stuff, and I came away from it with a positive approach. Britney Fox would release their second album, Boys in Heat, in December of 1989, and it was the tail end of the glam metal scene. The record didn't match the commercial success of the group's first record, peaking at number 79 on the album charts. There was also rifts forming in the band between Davidson and Smith and the rest of the members. As Smith would reveal to VW Music, Dean wanted it to be all about him being the main songwriter and the lead singer, and I get that. But instead of being thankful for the Cinderella affiliation, he seemed to resent it at the time. They did, however, get some big touring spots for the album when they played Europe with Alice Cooper, and at one point they were actually booked to do some shows with Kiss in North America, but in a sign of the band's fading star, they got dropped from the tour. Kiss would end up enlisting Slaughter, who put out their multi-platinum debut record in 1990, Stick It To Ya. However, Britney Fox's manager would line up a bunch of gigs doing headlining shows at smaller clubs, which actually were pretty good paydays. But unfortunately, things fell apart. Davidson was disappointed with the progress of the group's second record, and also contributing to the tension was the fact that Smith and Davidson had musical disagreements. Davidson was seeing other bands getting a lot of traction around this time, like the Black Crows, and he wanted to change the group's musical style. His bandmates, meanwhile, looked at every album as a gradual evolution. Davidson would end up leaving Britney Fox in April of 1990 after an onstage altercation between himself and guitarist Michael Kelly Smith. Apparently, Smith's arm during the live gig was either broken or severely injured. Davidson would go on to form a new group called Black Eyed Susan, who actually got a recording contract with Polygram, but the project was a commercial failure, ultimately ending in 1992. Davidson would remark to the Chicago Tribune shortly after his departure, saying, first off, I was controlled by management and the label. He would also go on to refer to Britney Fox's sound as, and I quote, prefabricated. The loss of Davidson was a massive blow for the band and their second record, but Britney Fox hadn't yet lost the recording contract. The label gave them half a year to find a replacement, but it took them a year to find a new frontman. They were soon dropped by Columbia, but they found a new frontman in Tommy Paris, who at the time was actually shopping for his own record deal. Thankfully for the band, they found a new label in Atlantic-owned East West Records. Britney Fox would release their third record in 1991 called Bite Down Hard, which featured guest appearances from guitar Zach Wilde and Poison drummer Ricky Rocket. The album, however, stiffed, and the band, despite toning down their glam image, just couldn't make any money on the road. Couple this with the rise of grunge and alternative rock, and the fact that the chemistry between the members was never the same after Davidson left, and it was an uphill battle to soldier on. In the years since the band disbanded, Smith would teach guitar, his wife and him actually started rescuing cats, and now live in a farm where they rescue horses. He would play in a band called Razmanaz for a short period of time that actually got some traction on XM Radio, but they were on an indie label that just didn't have distribution. It was in the year 2000 the band would reform with their most recent lineup thanks to Spitfire Records, who told Johnny D that if the band reformed, they'd do a live record for them. However, another version of events is that the band appeared on VH1's show Where Are They Now, and Squire Eagle Rock Records saw the episode and reached out to the former members. Britney Fox would do some live shows for their 2001 live record, and the record did well enough that they did another record for the label in 2002, Springhead Motor Shark. But touring and making money was again a problem. Smith would admit to Totally Driven TV's YouTube channel that the band toured for two months on their live record, and each member only made $58. The band soon disbanded again in 2003, and since then, Britney Fox has had on and off reunions, bassist Billy Childs being the only constant member. Smith, for his part, has opted not to partake in the more recent reunions due to his guitar teaching business. However, in 2010, it came out that the group's original frontman, Dizzy Dean Davidson, resurfaced and tried to reform the band with the original lineup, but Smith at the time had no interest. Smith has said more recently that he doesn't consider the most recent lineup of the band to really be Britney Fox, but rather a cover band. This year, Smith has said that he may be open to revisiting the original lineup, but it will come with a few stipulations. Uh, number one, Dean would have to be involved in it. As well, the scheduling would have to make sense since the members are spread out all over the globe. 
that does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. And as always, if you have suggestions for future topics you'd like to see me cover, use the link in the description box below, and we'll see you again in Rock Culture Stories.